welcome to Sexually Charged Radio. I'm Ruthie, here with my co-host. Thomas. And our other co-host. Lauren. And Lauren, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, people who have been listening to us for a while probably know a bit about Thomas and myself already. Um, and we'll do a pronoun check before we get started, but I would love to hear you introduce yourself. My name is Lauren. I'm a counselor and coach with the uh, ADHD and Asperger's Center. I specialize in ADHD and Asperger's and generalize in everything else. Nice. Well, we're super excited to have you here. Um, we met you at the psychology panel thing that we were doing the other day and invited people to co-host. So um, I'm super, super excited to hear all your perspectives, both from that work and from outside of that job as well. Uh, yeah. Do we, what pronouns do we each want to use? Yeah, that's a, always good to do a pronoun check-in. Uh, so I'm Thomas and I use the pronouns he and they. And I'm Ruthie. I use the pronouns they exclusively. I'm Lauren. I use she, but I'm open to anything else. All right. Sounds good. Pronoun wise. Well, we have such good... <laughs> good to clarify. Good to clarify. Yeah, sure. yes. um, so we have some great questions that uh, folks said that we could take from the psych panel and talk about today. Some of them we didn't even get to talk about on the psych panel. Laura, which one would you like to start with? I'd like to start by asking, what are common misconceptions about sex? So do you, do you talk much about sex in your work life? Uh, I'm open to it. I talk about whatever my clients want to talk about. So um, thus far, that hasn't always been what they've wanted to talk about. But uh, yeah, but it's, it's part of what we do when they do. So <laughs> do, have they brought in many misconceptions so far? Or is, or is part of the misconception that it's hard to talk about and you can't bring it into that kind of sphere? It's interesting how people uh, can... I feel like there, in a lot of parts of society, is such a stigma around talking about sex. Mm -hmm. And for some people, even when they talk to a therapist, it's like they're still ashamed to talk about things like that. Yeah. Well, I know from my own bring upbringing, which included going to a private Catholic high school in the States, but also just kind of being a, a part of more mainstream white privilege North American culture, um, one of the misconceptions about sex seemed to be leaving it unspoken, both with your partners and with professionals. So, you know, your partners are supposed to read your mind and know what you want, maybe better than you know what you want. Maybe your partner's supposed to show you what you want, like, because you're not supposed to figure that out for yourself. And then I wonder if that crosses over to professional relationships, too. Like, um, I can't um, bring it up or be directive about my needs to learn more about this or to understand more about my body or to address health concerns because we're not supposed to talk about it directly. Other people are just supposed to figure it out or leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the stigma around sex is really fascinating. I do a lot of research in workplace settings. And we often think, you know, sex does not belong in the workplace. And to certain regards, yes, certain workplaces it doesn't belong in, um, in some ways. But sex is also a natural part of the human experience. And so not talking about it just creates this vacuum in a lot of situations where suddenly people can feel really uncomfortable bringing it up and then it raises this, this question well in certain environments if i talk about it is that sexual harassment or is that um you know some other form of, of making people uncomfortable when it is a natural part of our life so that misconception that we can't talk about it can actually have some very negative repercussions down the road about creating that environments that are outright hostile towards sex and the discussion of sex when you said that you made such a good point but i also felt uncomfortable at the same time and I, <laughs> and I realized that for me it was it was um really about my thoughts about how i don't necessarily trust people in a professional environment to separate sexuality talk and being from being coercive mm. or having a power trip off it or um, asking me to be sexual in a way that I don't want to mingle with my work environment, which I think is a power and coercion thing right there. And potentially, you know, I mean, like, you know, I always had this hard and fast rule, like, don't, don't flirt with employees while they're at work because they have to be nice to you mm -hmm. or their job is at risk, right? So then those things where you might not even realize there's a, there's a power move going on. It's complicated because I can see wanting it to be happy and healthy. I talk about sex at my job and with my coworkers pretty much constantly, but I have a special excuse to mm -hmm. because it's my area of work. I wonder how that would be if I didn't have that excuse. What do you think? Well, I wanted to, to 
address another aspect of this altogether, which is almost more a question of what are some assumptions about sex yeah. than um, misconceptions, or maybe they're both. One is that everybody enjoys sex. One yeah. is that like the more you have, the more points you get. Um, another is everybody's good at it. Uh, and that it's always good. Or you should be naturally good at it. No, yeah, like you should fails. you should know yeah. what you're doing. From the start, automatically. Exactly. It's natural. And yeah. maybe it'll hurt the first time, but don't worry, once it's over, it'll be great after that, always. You know, um, sex is like pizza. Even when it's not that good, it's not that bad either. It's still pizza, yeah. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but there is such a thing as bad sex. And bad pizza. Um, I remember when I was... Uh, first exposed to topic about sex, which was mostly, like, from the media and from my friends. Um, it wasn't from, like, you know, my parents so much or some priest who took me, or priestess who took me in it and trained me in it, which is what a lot of cultures uh, have. Um, so it was a lot of things about, like, men want sex and women don't. Uh, men use uh, women for sex, abandon them, and women get their heart broken. These are all, like, the narratives that I kept being told. Um, so I responded by wanting to be a feminist, and my version at that time of being a feminist meant anything a man can do, a woman can do, so I'm going to use men for sex. You know, like, I'll just subvert it and uh, make it horrible in a different way. Um, <laughs> that was that was one solution. <laughs> but a lot of people I do think do that. They, like, they're feeling like there's just kind of these um, polarized options and it's kind of one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to be trapped in this box, your only option is the other box. Mm -hmm. And other uh, misconceptions are that there's only one way to have sex or some, you know, sex means one thing. So there's been a lot of, uh, if somebody, uh, like, had a lot of experiences with people who are attracted to me and assume that... I want to have sex with them in the same way they want to have, have sex. Like, it's just, you know, the fantasy is of that. Um, so I like flirting. And and sometimes, like, when I flirt with someone or and when I even want to be sexual with them, it doesn't necessarily mean I want to have intercourse with them. Right. And sometimes even when I, you know, get them into my bedroom and we're, like, un and we're naked, it's like, okay, so now this is what we're going to do. And I'm like, oh, shoot. That's not actually what I wanted to do mm -hmm. sexually. So it's like, and, and I've even had partners where I've been like, there are multiple things we could do. And they're like, no, there aren't. <laughs> like, I don't want to do any of those other things. This mm -hmm. is the only thing I want. So that's another uh, misconception about... Absolutely. Like, we, we kind of feel like perhaps other people have the same social scripts or fantasies or expectations we do. But without that extra layer of communication, which we've already addressed, is really hard to do. Um... That's, that's difficult. And even the notion of bringing up something to explore, whether you want to do it with another person, they may receive it as obligatory, which is problematic as well. You know, like, I might want to have oral sex with you, but uh, we should actually see if we're on the same page about things first. Oh, well, that must be the okay, because you brought it up. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the desire to not communicate it about it is problematic. Although, also sometimes too much communication does kind of kill it sometimes as well yeah i mean that's something i'm grappling with too because what where's the where's the fine line can i ask that as another question where's yeah. the fine line between too much communication and actually not yeah. because i've been yeah and it so differs right mm -hmm. from situation to situation so as i've disclosed in the show before you know like um i i am sexual with people that i don't know very well and don't intend to see again and so in those times like there's sometimes more communication and sometimes less communication and it's, it's um, such a, so I really want to use a curse word, but I think we might be too early in the evening. It's, a, it's such a crapshoot, is what I will say. Yeah, that's good. About it, because, uh, because it's, it's all of these finely tuned social skills and intuition that are learned and that different people will have different skill levels in and different, um, different access to, right? So, so there's also a lot of assumption that the other person is at whatever level of social skill and intuition you're practicing that they're meeting you at the same place too. It's not, um, it's not very clear and it's not very accessible across people. What do you think, Thomas? I know that you never uh, you never do anything without thorough communication. <laughs> oh, I, um, yeah, of course. <clears throat> Got a little hot in here. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, there's definitely situational factors that really play into uh, how much communication happens. And I think understanding that certain situational environments facilitate less communication than others. Um, and that's, it, it's 
oh gosh, I mean, there's there's the whole literatures around this sure. about about hookup culture and about. But these literatures uh, are often very problematic at the same time. Oh, absolutely. They're often very heteronormist and really full of gender assumptions. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just okay. get really upset <laughs> about this sometimes. And, but I think like it's such a convoluted and fascinating area because that communication line just doesn't exist. There, there is no fine line to say this is too much and this is too little because every person is going to have a different level on any given day in every given situation. And even, so can I use you as a partner? Please do it. So if Ruthie and I were, were dating or seeing each other yeah, or whatever, yeah. involved, and you know, one day our communication is very minimal, doesn't mean that the next time it's gonna be very minimal. It might be we need a lot of communication that next time. Right. So the same partner, but we also yeah. romanticize minimal communication. It's not necessarily a hookup. Like we, we idealize this notion of people who know each other well, giving each other a wink and a nod and like, hey, hey, and mm-hmm. then something happens, right? Mm-hmm. But that's based on uh, kind of a bedrock of other communication happening. So I think of two different levels of communication I, when I think about what therapists are trying to say and stuff. And one of them is the communication about what you want to do or about the topic at hand. And the other is called meta communication. It's the communicating about how you want to communicate. Mm-hmm. So there can even start with that, you know, um, would, would you enjoy like really talking this out a bit or do you just want to just get to something that we feel like we can both do? And then if the person is like, no, I, I, like it's hotter for me if we just get to it, then the communication becomes very few questions, right? So um, if you're both on the same page about that, of course you don't have to do it that way just because the other person wants to. So it, it would be maybe what your deal breaker or most important priorities are. For me, that would be around safety and protection. Um, so, and that isn't a question for me because I'm a, I'm an all barriers person. That's a deal breaker. I'm say, you know, um, it's important to me to use all these barriers, gloves, condoms, dental dams, whatever the case may be. Um, and if, if that's not something you're okay with, then we won't be a good match for each other. Um, and that's not for me to pressure the other person, but to just say like, this is, this is a boundary for me. And it's okay if we're not a great match for each other. Like we'll find other people to hook up with. Um, and then my usual second question, if I can ask three questions, I'll talk about the, th- I'll, I'll get confirmation about protection and clarify any questions about that. I'll ask, um, what would make it hot for you? And I hope they ask me back and how will I know if it's going wrong? And I hope they ask me back. If we can really only ask two things or very minimal, I'll just say it's gotta be full barriers. How will I know if this is going wrong? <laughs> I just did a workshop recently on conveying fantasies and hookup culture, so I feel like I'm like on um, for this topic now. But not that everybody has to do it like I do, but maybe you think about it, and if it feels wrong, then that will help guide you in what feels right, because you don't want to do it the way I just said. Uh, I'd like to plug a resource that I'm not making any money off of or anything, but there's this website, autostraddle.com. I love that. A U T O. S-D-R-A-D-D-L-E, yep. and they have this section called You Need Help, and uh, one article is called How to Talk to Your Partners About Sex, and it has these seven-page uh, worksheets for people who get turned on by filling out worksheets. Such people exist. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like all these questions, mm-hmm. um, and the first two pages are just this whole list of you know activities that you may or may not enjoy doing. Um, and there are more, like, there's a page about, like, pronouns you like using and, and words for genitalia and all these kinds of things that, those are the types of things people don't talk about, but you're, like, getting really hot and heavy and someone says mm-hmm. some, like, calls their junk something that, you know, like, junk. And you're like, oh, that, that sounded weird. I don't want my junk being called junk. You know, like, mm-hmm. any, anyway, so just on the, is overanalysis okay? If you're, if you're up for overanalysis, uh, I recommend... Well, it can be hot, flirty talk where you're establishing shared expectations and goals and what is shared and what isn't, mm-hmm. and still is like flirty and great buildup and stuff too, mm-hmm. if you want it to be. Some people prefer to do that conversation without flirting, some people like to do it with, and you could take it either way, you know. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really like about that worksheet idea is that's actually homework that you can do individually beforehand, and I think that's a misconception around sex is that it doesn't take prep work. Like sex mm. does take prep work mm-hmm. in lots of different ways. But I think that worksheet is a great way to think, okay, let's go through these questions. Can I answer them about myself first? Do I know myself in terms of what words I like used and what words I don't like used? What activities I like and what activities I don't like? And yes, that can be hot and heavy just doing it by yourself going through that worksheet. Totally. But it also then, you know, prepares you. You've done that homework. Now when you go out into the real world, you can use that homework. You can to bring your best self. And, and say, this is what I really want. the likelihood want. of success, right? 
Um, speaking of increasing the likelihood of success, you are listening to Sexually Charged Radio. We're here on 93.3 FM CFRU, and uh, you can find us live streaming on CFRU's website. You can also find us on YouTube by uh, just Googling uh, Sexually Sexually Charged. charged. I almost gave my other social media stuff. (laughs) Thomas, what if somebody has a question they want to send in? So if you have a question or a topic or something you just want to get off your chest, you can email us at AskSC, that's the initials for Sexually Charged, at uoguelph, G-U-E-L-P-H, dot C-A. And those questions will all go to our wonderful volunteers at Student Wellness at the University of Guelph. And they'll go through those questions, help (laughs) us come up with answers, and you might hear your question or comment on the air. Awesome. Um, Can we go around and round robin some more misconceptions or assumptions? Mm Because I was really having fun hearing your list, and it made me think about mine too. Um, This one isn't quite as short to say, but I'll try to say it as brief as I can. Part of my religious upbringing was about seeing sex as something that only happens within a heterosexual marriage, and that, like, Jesus comes in, and it's this really big thing, and it's automatically amazing and bonding and intimate and stuff like that. So I ended up with this weird misconception that whoever people had sex with the first time, they would take it as seriously, and it would automatically become Mm. a forever relationship, because it's supposed to happen within a forever relationship, so if you jump that ahead... That's a dangerous assumption that is uh, that I've run into with my clients and my workshop attendees having that assumption as well, plenty of times. Also, that um, that there's only one kind of sex, and that's penis and vagina intercourse. Then mm-hmm. nothing else counts as sex. It's just foreplay, or it's just queer, so it's not sex. I don't know. So I've never had sex. What? <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I feel like there's a unicorn in the room. <laughs> Are you really okay to be on this show? Yeah, right now? yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really questioning <laughs> if I've got authority to speak. Um, my misconception building off of Ruthie's is that, uh, that orgasm always happens in sex and that sex requires orgasm to happen. Um, that's a huge misconception out there. You don't need to have an orgasm and to have really good sex and not all really good sex will always lead to an orgasm. Bodies don't always work that way and that's okay and that can be awesome and hot. Most people don't want their body to work that way that time that can be a goal to not as well and another is that you like the for you know person a gives person b their orgasm like you mm. give it to someone i remember reading there's this thick book the guide to getting getting it on love that book yeah they, they have all the good resources <laughs> they publish a new one every year basically and there was this one section called whose orgasm is it anyway and it's just like, yeah, it's it's mine to have, not yours to give me. So don't like take all the credit and all the pride and frustration with yourself if I don't have one, you know, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And self-stimulation can be a great part of sex too. So you may be physically creating that orgasm with yourself and the other person is around to whatever level of interaction and that's hot. That's something as a sex therapist I often suggest as an idea to people is to, to just try masturbating in each other's vicinity, either mm-hmm. looking at each other or not. Another misconception is that you can have too much or too little sex. I mean, I think we've had some other shows that actually get into that topic in more detail, if not future episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no such thing as too little sex. And there's really nothing, uh, nothing that like qualifies or quantifies too much sex. As long as you're happy, it's done consensually. um, And the other person is enjoying and having fun. It's not interrupting quality of life in that you're... Um, not fulfilling your social obligations or not able to do your job or you're not neglecting your children or whatever. So those are fairly extreme situations. If you want to, you can fit in a lot of sex into your day and still fulfill those obligations of day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. And I thought of two other categories of misconceptions. Mm. One is that everybody else views sex the way you do. Mm. So like heteronormativity and also assuming that everybody is sexual because there are a lot of people who are asexual and just don't want it or don't want it under most circumstances or like all kinds of levels. Um, And another misconception is that nobody is like you. The whole like, I'm the only one with this particular fetish in the world, Um, the shame and guilt that can often accompany that. There are, whatever your preference is in any way, there is somebody else, in fact, probably a community, probably on FetLife, (laughs) um, that has the same whatever. 
Oh, it's my turn again. Um, <laughs> so uh, also that people in relationships have to have all the same sexual interests and drives mm-hmm. and skills as each other. So, you know, there, there are many delightful relationships where, you know, one or more persons is asexual and one or more persons involved in the relationship is quite sexual. And so um, it could be that they're um, enjoying sex for different purposes. It could be that they've open the relationship. It could be that they're happy not having sex with each other and base the relationship on other things. Um, there's all sorts of stuff with that. Hmm. I always feel like when you say something, it then gives me another misconception to come up. And, and that vanilla sex or common sex or whatever term the kids are using nowadays um, is bad sex. But you know what? If you like vanilla sex... That's awesome. I, I'm saying the word awesome a lot today. Straight up PNV missionary style is, is your thing with well, the other person? Like, or straight up anal love sex. It. Like whatever, if that's your yeah. vanilla, whatever your vanilla is, and if that's all you really want, and that's what you get off on, that's what you enjoy, and you don't want to ex- go past that, that's also okay. Like That misconception that you always have to be adventurous, mm-hmm. um, I think, can be a dangerous misconception. Sorry, um, pushing people beyond their comfort zones in a way that's not... Um, self-defined or Mm self-determined. I'd like to ask another question here, which is um, because, uh, Ruthie, you just said something about how, like, couples might actually get different things from out of sex. And earlier, Thomas, you spoke to that, like, sex doesn't always result in orgasm. I'm just so curious. There's so much more out of sex than what people assume. So I'd love to expand um, that subtopic about you know, that sex is only about orgasm or is about pleasing a partner or dot, dot, dot. Like, what else can it be about? So, I mean, some people like the intimacy. Some people like the, like, they just feel like it's like a good workout. Like, the same thing (laughs) as going to the gym. Um, Some people have sex or masturbate just to sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. Some people want a baby or many babies. (laughs) Um, The excitement factor. Yeah. They just want the energy of, oh, you know what? I'm doing something new. I'm doing something different. This is a different person. So there can be that adrenaline that comes from, or, you know, mm-hmm. vo- you know, voyeurism and those sorts of uh, types of sexual behavior that have different um, purposes to it. It can be identity affirming, or mm-hmm. you just, you just like human touch and that's one way to get human touch. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't necessarily feel erotic to a person in the same way, but they just like being really close with someone and that's a closeness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it could, it could just feel relationship affirming. I mean, I, my guideline for folks is try to make sex neutral or better. Um, and sometimes you say like, okay, this is kind of neutral for me, but I love the affirmation of us as a couple. And I love like the other things that go around with it. So there's nothing bad or unlikable happening. I'm kind of so, so in this, but I like other aspects. Mm -hmm. If that's okay for everybody involved, then that's great too. What do you think? Yeah. And also it can uh, feel good as in, it feels like a massage. Totally. Just being touched mm-hmm. without there being an orgasm or with. And also the, you said uh, self-identity. I want to add, like, you can get to know yourself better, get to know your body and physical sensations, especially if you're someone who's, like, a student or working in a way that you're only thinking all the time. It's mm-hmm. good to actually feel and get in touch with your mm-hmm. body, and you can get to know someone else better. So true. I yeah. like the sounds. I think that's fun. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, the fun part, right? Like, you know, there's there's lots of ways for a thing to be fun, whether that's eating pizza or having sex like there's lots of ways for things to be fun i laugh a lot during sex i mean not like every single time i'm having sex that would would be a whole other story i mean that can be that's your game (laughs) but like every once in a while just like because you're doing all of these things you don't normally do you're making sounds you don't normally make you're you know just finding pleasure in so many different ways it's like Mm -hmm. all i can do is sometimes just laugh and the other person will often give me this like a what just happened i'm like no, the, that's happy. part of the human experience yeah. for me. And I think sex can do that on so many levels that don't involve orgasm. So that's a great question. Yeah, and I want to add to, you know, another misconception is that your genitalia is your only erogenous zone. Stuff feels amazing all over, like your thighs, under, like your armpits, you know, like the anywhere. Ears. <sighs> could just you know i i feel like whenever uh, there's a massage like i ask for massages a lot and people when they want to get like flirty they try and go closer and closer to like you know certain areas and i'm like no actually the other parts you're massaging feel more hot mm-hmm. and it seems surprising and weird but totally oh my gosh these are such good conversations do we uh, we have just a couple minutes left are there are there any things we wanted to expand about this i have like three minutes Um, Do we want to briefly talk about that one? Sure. All right, go for it. Next question. Is masturbation good for me? It's 
very good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so research does suggest, limited research that exists, that there are certain um, health benefits to masturbation. Now, if, if masturbation is not good for you emotionally or, you know, or if your body doesn't work in a way where that does feel good and healthy, then no. Um, but generally speaking, the research seems to suggest that it is a healthy thing on a physical level. What do you think? Uh, I now regret that I dove into this with only three minutes because I feel we could talk for half an hour about, <laughs> you know, masturbation techniques and, like, different ideas around masturbation. Um, but I guess it also ties into what we were saying about all the different, like, reasons sex could be good. Mm -hmm. um, masturbation, you can learn about yourself. It can help you sleep, I find. Um... It's one of the few um, research-supported treatments for restless leg, if people have that. Um, really? I think that's the sweetest research. I'm not sure. It was out a few years ago that they tested against some other things, and it was it was quite useful for a number of people, and there's not, not a whole lot of great options for that out there. So, mm. bonus. <laughs> there you go. Wow. So, yeah. I mean... Uh, in the end, we decide what's what's good for us on multiple factors, right? Um, is masturbation bad for you? Well, if, if you've decided it's bad for you, if you have a, a moral belief system or something like that, that it's not good for you, well, then that's a separate set of considerations, and none of us can really determine that for you. Um, is, it, is it innately harmful as an activity? I would say there's probably some people's bodies where some harm can happen that way, but it's probably fairly rare. And I'd like to speak to the role of imagination. Mm. Masturbation, you can get to know what you like thinking about, what you enjoy. Um, you know, the topic of porn is a whole different topic, which could uh, it could be good for you, but it could be bad for you. Mm -hmm. Like that, I just want to say that. So complicated. It would be not, like, if you use porn to masturbate, I'd be curious whether you could also masturbate without porn. Mm. I have a story, but I won't share it on here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we are That's... pretty much at the end of our time. Thank you for this just robust conversation. I feel like it went so quickly. Um, does anyone just have a parting, like, one-sentence thought on either of these two questions to end us up on? I think if you have an assumption about sex, it's worth questioning it. Mm. Question your assumptions. Read about it. Listen to our show um, to see if it really holds true. Nice. Nice. Did you have a part of that? Well, one connection between these two topics is, would you consider masturbation sex? Oh my goodness. All right. So that is everyone's assignment for dinner conversation <laughs> or social media conversation. Um, do you consider masturbation sex? And perhaps we can kick off a future episode with that. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren and Thomas, as thank always. You, thank Ruthie. you, so much. <laughs> and you've been listening to Sexually Charged Radio on CFRU 93.3, and we will see you at an upcoming episode. Thank you.